Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. Now, I've shown you how to make tea nuts before, but the last time I did it, I did it as a pedagogical exercise to demonstrate some best practices in machining. The tea nuts weren't really the point. This time, I just need some tea nuts in a hurry, and I'm going to show you a very fast way to make them. So let's go. Now, the quickest way to make tea nuts is with your credit card. But if you need some specialty ones that can't be bought, or you can't wait for shipping, something like that, then here's a way to get it done. I'm going to start with this bar of 1018 mild steel that's close in dimension to my final tea nuts. I'm going to make two groups of four. Four is a good number to make at once on my mill, and I'll show you why here in a moment. I need to make some offset ones and some ones with a small quarter twenty thread in them. An adjustable parallel is really the key to this method. You want to be able to get that stock right at the very top edge of the vise where you've got just enough grip there, but you still have clearance for the entire part above the jaws. So I'm going to double check that my clearance is good there, and we are good to go. Now I'm going to touch off to get centered, but I'm not going to bother with the edge finder because this material is getting machined away. So again, this is all about speed. I can just touch off very lightly with the cutter on one side and then zero the DRO on the Y axis, come back to the other side, touch off lightly again, and then use the half function on the Y axis. And now we are centered. So all of our operations are going to be done on that zero center line there, which is going to save us a lot of time as well. I like to call this method HNC or human numerical control machining. The idea is to machine the part entirely out of stock sticking up out of the vise, much like a CNC setup would be done. So starting with slightly oversized stock and good access to all surfaces, you can just follow the numbers on the DRO and machine almost every surface in this one setup. So you're just removing everything that doesn't look like an elephant. It's efficient because most of your work is done in one setup, and it's actually quite precise because you're never removing the part and needing to re-indicate or re-square up anything. You're not losing precision through multiple setups. Now the disadvantage to this method is it requires moving a lot more chips. So the bigger your machines are, the more benefits you'll get from this method. And on small machines like mine, this method is often actually slower than other methods for, for example, squaring up stock. But for something like T-nuts, it works really great. As you can see, I'm just doing counterclockwise laps around the part, moving the same distance from zero on Y, and moving counterclockwise so that I'm always conventional milling and not climb milling. And my distance from zero is half the width of the narrow part of the T-nut plus the radius of my cutter. Very little math here involved, which is nice. And then I'm just going down to the desired depth of the T portion of the T-nut. I usually aim for about five to ten thou under all of the dimensions of the actual T slots to give you a nice free running fit that won't get stuck if there's the occasional chip or something in there. Now that's starting to look like a T nut, and you might think, well, we're basically done, but the base there, the original width of the stock, is actually still too wide. So now I do another series of passes around the very outside of that stock. You can see how I'm just creating a little step there. And this is bringing the final overall width of the T-nut to final dimension. And here you can really see where that HNC idea comes into play here. I'm milling the entire part out of stock that's sticking up out of the vise. The secret to success here in this technique is getting that stock to where your final pass is going to be just above the vise jaw because you still need enough meat down in that vise jaw for a good grip but you need to be able to do the entire dimension of the part in one setup and then i'll do a little skim pass across the top just to clean that up quick sidebar here on drilling and tapping the holes because every time i make t-nuts this way people always comment why don't you drill and tap all the holes now before taking it out of the setup and the, the reason that I don't do that is because it's actually difficult to get the holes properly centered until the pieces are cut apart and the ends are faced. Now, obviously for a T-nut, things being perfectly centered doesn't matter that much, but it's a good learning for other types of machining operations where if you need a hole perfectly centered, it's much easier to do the hole after the surfaces from which that hole needs to be referenced. You can also see here why I said at the top that I'm doing these in batches of four. This is much easier if you make T-nut stock that's about the width of your vise. If you go longer than this, it gets difficult to support at the ends, unless you go much, much longer, and then you have room for machinist jacks and such, but then, you know, you're doing a lot more setup work. I'll do a quick check of dimensions here. The great thing about T-nuts is that they are extremely forgiving. 
Really the only super critical dimension on them is the depth here on the short side. You have to make sure that they aren't going to bottom out on the bolt when you tighten them up against the T-slot. They need to be still below the surface of the table when tight. Otherwise you won't get an actual clamping action. There's my blank for one set of T-nuts and now I can flip it over and I've got a face mill in there and that little stub that we were hanging on to is now just going to get machined away. And you can see how, again, if you have a big machine, this method is super efficient because this little stub on the bottom here could probably just be machined away in one pass. On my tiny little mill here, I think it was eight passes, but still, it's uh, still pretty efficient. I mean, it's a lot of passes, but at least you can, you know, tidy up the shop or work on your dance moves while doing this. Well, that finish is unexpectedly great, and this is a new insert face mill designed specifically for small mills that I've been showing recently, and uh, I'm really pleased with this thing. It does a great job. You can see how it's making really nice chips there, kind of golden yellow, a little purple on the edges, kind of just where you want them to be temperature-wise. I like to think of those as scale models of A-bomb chips. And the very last pass never quite machines away the bottom of that lip because the material just kind of gets pushed over once it's down to a few atoms there. So I just bring in the can opener and peel that off of there. Now at this point you might be tempted to cut all these T-nuts apart with a bandsaw or something and go ahead and face off all the ends. The problem is that's a lot of setups on a lot of little parts. So here's a quicker way to break this up into T-nuts. I'm going to set it up vertically here with my slitting saw. I'm turning the spindle by hand there to touch off on, on the top surface. And then I'm just going to feed down with the column. I'm doing all the feeding here on Z with the column. The mill is fully locked because we're going to need lots of rigidity here. You can see I've got it clamped up with a 1, 2, 3 block there held in the vise because this is kind of a tall setup. Now I have the arbor extended on the slitting saw so that there's just room between the spindle nose there and the saw to get one T-nut in there. So you can see how I can do a single pass and create one T-nut. And the great thing about this method is that because this is a slitting saw, they're a machining tool, they leave a finished machined surface behind and they're very precise. So you don't have to do any measuring, you don't have to do any cleanup passes, you don't have to face the ends or do a bunch of setups for that. It's all very quick. One cut and you've got two finished ends on each T-nut. Now you do have to adjust your setup between each piece, which doesn't take too long, but if you wanted to make a whole pile of these, I would actually recommend a setup on the lathe. And I learned this from a book by Kozo Hiaoka, who's an amazing model engineer. You've probably seen his books. And uh, in one of his books, he demonstrates putting a vise on the cross slide and feeding into a slitting saw in the lathe spindle. And it's a really efficient way. It's basically the same setup I'm showing here, but horizontally. And it's very repeatable and very quick. So you don't have to readjust your setup between each piece. This next setup is gonna look a little fussy, but we only have to do it once. So I've got some thin parallels and I'm gonna use the edge finder to center up on the X axis. The Y axis is still centered from before. And I'll bring in my vise stop here. And then I can do all eight of my T-nuts with this setup. It's gonna be very efficient. So I'm gonna drill tapping drill size for all my holes. And I'm not bothering with center drill here because this is a T-nut and if the hole is five thou off center, it really doesn't matter. Just start the drill carefully, let it find a center and it'll be good enough. And then I can just slide that nut out of there and slide in the next one and do the same thing again. So again, no center drilling, no pilot drilling, none of that fussiness here because we're more interested in speed than precision for basic T-nuts. If those tapping drill sizes look a little small, it's because they are for quarter 20. I wanted some T-nuts for use with smaller clamping hardware that I use a lot. Here's the first of my second batch, and you can see I'm using a much larger drill. These are standard for me 3816 hardware, but you can see that they are off center. So the way I did these is I just made the blanks shorter and I'm using the same setup as I was for the full size T-nuts, and that automatically offsets the holes. 
These offset T-nuts are for my rotary table where you often have to clamp things right at the outside edges of the T-slot, but you don't want anything sticking out past the edges of the table because, of course, it rotates. You know, it's right, it's right there in the name. Rotary table. Rotation table. Rotor table that rotates. Do, do I need to explain that more? I feel like I need to explain that more. I proceeded to tap all these holes by hand, but the great thing about T-nuts is that they are such a simple thing that it's a good opportunity to experiment with operations. So for example, if you wanted to try your hand at power tapping, now would be the time because if you bork it up, yeah, you're not really going to hurt anything. A final and important step is to stake the bottom of the thread. And this is basically just deforming or you know, ruining the thread on the bottom of the T-nut there. And that's to make sure that hardware that you thread into them can't thread all the way through. This is important because if you accidentally thread a bolt all the way through a T-nut and it bottoms out in the T-slot, well, now you've created a jack. It's going to start pushing the T-nut up into the underside of the slot, and it's possible to break the top of the T-slot out doing that. So it's not super likely to happen, but it can happen. So that's why commercial T-nuts that you buy, you can't thread things all the way through them. There you go, some quick and dirty T-nuts. As I said before, this is something that's not usually worth your time to make, but if you want the practice with your mill or you need a specialty type of T-nut as shown here, then this is a quick way to make them. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you very much for watching. If you would, please support me on Patreon if you can. That is really what keeps this channel going. You can use the card there on the screen or the link down below. And I'll see you next time. Well, not really, because these are videos. It's a one-way medium. You can see me, but I... I can't see you. Look, narration is hard, okay?